Hello, my name is Daniel Fontenot. Welcome to Jewels of Truth. Would you pray with me that we may ask the Lord together uh, that he would show us the jewels of truth in his word? <clears throat> Our great and holy Father in heaven, as we take up again this study of the first and the last towers of Babel, we ask for the help of thy Holy Spirit. We ask, Father, that you would anoint our eyes with that heavenly eye salve, that we may discern the deep things of God. O Lord our God, we pray, especially at this time of the earth's history, at the end of the world, that we may discern the first and the last fall of Babel. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would give us wisdom and discernment that we may distinguish between truth and error. We pray that we would be able to discern that the end of all things is indeed at hand. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome again to Jewels of Truth, and this is part seven in the series, The First and the Last Towers of Babel. Right at the onset, I want to make this note. And this is one of the purposes of this part of the study. This point here, here, I want to make clear that Babylon begins and ends at the Euphrates River. So we will show that here presently. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 11 where the story of the building of the Tower of Babel and the scattering is located. So in Genesis chapter 11, verse 2, it says, And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And, of course, it goes on and there in verse 3, And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Okay, so it doesn't say that Babylon started at the Euphrates River in these verses. But it doesn't take a lot of research to find out that the land of Shinar was located on the banks of the Euphrates River. And then we have Revelation 16. Okay, here is the last Tower of Babel. Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 through 14. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. So when we read in Revelation 16 that the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, we must understand, if we have eyes to see, if our eyes are, are indeed uh, anointed with that heavenly eye salve, that this is speaking about that vial falling upon Babylon. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. We will address that verse again later in a later presentation, later study. So, okay, now Sister White's statement that we have read here before, we read it the last presentation, the last study part, on part six. We will read it again to make another point. For a time, the descendants of Noah continued to dwell among the mountains where the ark had rested. As their numbers increased, apostasy soon led to division. Those who desired to forget their Creator and to cast off the restraint of His law felt a constant annoyance from the teaching and example of their God-fearing associates. And after a time, they decided to separate from the worshipers of God. Accordingly, they journeyed to the plain of Shinar, on the banks of the river Euphrates. 
They were attracted by the beauty of the situation and the fertility of the soil, and upon this plain they, be, they determined to make their home. Here, here, on the banks of the Euphrates River, they decided to build a city, and in it a tower of such stupendous height as should render it the wonder of the world. I hope that all of us here, as we read this paragraph together, that we discern spiritual things here. These enterprises were designed to prevent the people from scattering abroad in colonies. God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth, to replenish and subdue it. But these Babel builders determined to, to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Thus, their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. Notice, the magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetuating their fame to the latest generations, Patriarchs and Prophets 118 and 119. One thing, and I mentioned this in the last, the last presentation on during part six, what we're talking about here in part is the daily, paganism. Paganism has always continually magnified itself against God. The daily, we're talking about the daily in Daniel 8.11, the daily is paganism. In Daniel 8.11, that word daily means continuance, and, and in that form, it's a noun. Only in the book of Daniel is the daily in the, the form of a noun. Now, I don't have this on the notes, but I hope that those of you who are watching this presentation are familiar with the fact, the truth that we learned years ago in this movement, that go, let, let's go to a Daniel, Daniel, Daniel 8, okay? Daniel 8, so that we'll, we, we will know exactly what we're talking about here. Daniel 8 and verse 11. Yea, he magnified himself. This is paganism. Pagan Rome also is involved with this. Pagan Rome magnified himself to the, even to the prince of the host. And that's exactly what pagan Rome did. It magnified itself against the prince of the host, the prince of the host being Jesus Christ. When he was on this earth, that's what pagan Rome did, especially when it crucified Christ. Jesus Christ. And by him, by paganism, the daily, uh, I'm sorry, by him, pagan Rome, the daily paganism was, take, it says take away, taken away, but that word taken away means to exalt. Just, we've, I've, I have presented these, these uh, matters before, Jeff Pippinger has presented these, uh, these matters before. Uh, just take your concordance. doesn't take a, a person with a huge brain to, uh, to, to understand this. Just take your concordance, look up the words taken away uh, there in Daniel 8.11 and also taken away in Daniel uh, 11 and verse 31. The two taken away, taken away there, uh, there are two different Hebrew words, okay? I'm not going to get into that right now. But my main point here, my main point is that the word daily, the way that it's written with, if you add the word sacrifice to it, then it's an adjective, the daily sacrifice, okay? 
But the word sacrifice is an added word. Sister White says in early writings, page 74 and 75, that the word sacrifice was added by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, okay? That's the only verse in all the Bible where Sister White addresses this matter, and she says that word doesn't belong to the text. There are other places in the Bible where you have words are italicized, and the italicized word doesn't do any violence. It does no violence to the text, but this does. That word sacrifice leads you on a wrong track, a wrong trail, okay? So, when you take, a word, take away the word sacrifice, sacrifice doesn't belong to the text, now the word daily becomes a noun, because it says, by him, the, the daily. Okay, the daily was taken away. It's a noun. That's the way it was in the original Hebrew. And that word daily, the, it means the continuance. Note also that the passage above from Patriarchs and Prophets that we just read states that the fame of the builders was intended to be perpetuated to the latest generations. So that thought that the, uh, the intention of the builders was that their fame was to be perpetuated to the latest, latest generations that's in harmony with what Sister White says. I mean, I, mean, I mean, that's in harmony with the word daily in the book of Daniel. It's the continuance. Paganism has continually, from the very beginning, continually exalted itself against God, against Jesus Christ. And so you have there the definition uh, or the word uh, the daily in... Uh, in uh, the Hebrew there, it's number uh, uh, 8548, okay? But I want you to pay attention to the, uh, the definition. Some words in that definition are not correct, okay? Whenever it says there in the middle of, of that definition, elliptically, the regular daily sacrifice, that's not correct. This, it's just not right. That's in, that, that is an error, they were following the traditional view, whoever wrote this definition, oh, you know, this because even the apostate Protestants believe the same thing. Uh, so, or very similar to this, at least, about the daily being Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. That's just, just simply not, not true. And, but that's not the, uh, the subject of this study anyway. We can cover that at a later date. So, notice also, we're on page two of the notes, the passage from Patriarchs and Prophets describes the tower as magnificent. This is in harmony with Daniel 8.11. So, you have the word magnified, you know, where there in Daniel 8.11, it says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, okay? Well, that word, as it turns out, that word magnified, one of the definitions of that word magnified is not only magnify, but also tower. Hmm. So ironically, ironically, providentially, the Hebrew word magnified in Daniel 8.11 is the same word as tower in Genesis 11 and verse 4. The same word. When you read about the Tower of Babel, that word tower in Genesis 11 verse 4 is the same word as magnified in Daniel 8.11. No coincidences there. A.T. Jones, in his book, Empires of the Bible, I put these words in the, these pa this passage in the notes because of some points that he makes that I think we need to understand in regards to the Tower of Babel. Um, in the Bible, this subject of the origin and affinity of races 
like all other scientific questions, is rather touched upon incidentally as connected with the history of mankind that in any formal and exact manner. I'm gonna, let, me read, let me read that again. In the Bible, this subject of the origin and affinity of races, like all other scientific questions, is rather touched upon incidentally as connected with the history of mankind than in any formal and exact manner. So it's just, he, he's just simply saying that uh, and go, people that write about the Tower of Babel, well, it's just an incident. Okay. Yet the information thus afforded is of inestimable value, being in fact the only trustworthy clue to guide the investigator through the uh, labyrinth in which later compilations and especially recent speculations have involved the whole matter. Infidelity has striven hard to impugn the statements of Scripture on this ground especially, and it is, it is uh, therefore satisfactory to know that the most candid and general researches strongly tend to, to corroborate the positions of Holy Writ relative to all the main points involved in the discussion. Until the building of the Tower of Babel, the descendants of Noah all dwelt together relatively in the same region, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Then, at the building of the tower, God confounded their language so that they could not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off the, to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. In an inscription of the great Nebuchadnezzar, there is a curious and striking reference to this story of Babel and the confusion of tongues. Now, he's going to give actually a quote from Nebuchadnezzar about the Tower of Babel. Can you imagine? Who would have known? He tells how he had repaired and embellished the tower in honor of one of his gods. So Nebuchadnezzar repaired and embellished the tower in honor of one of his gods, saying, The first, which is the house of the earth's base, the most ancient monument of Babylon, I had built and finished it. I have highly exalted its head, with bricks covered with copper. We say for the other, that is, this edifice, the house of the seven lights of the earth, the most ancient monument of Borsippa, a former king built it. They reckon 42 ages, but he did not complete its head. Yeah. I wonder why he didn't complete its head. Would, well, but do you think maybe the Lord intervened and uh, a, a lightning struck? God sent lightning, as Sister White said, and struck the tower of the, uh, the top of the tower and uh, threw it to the ground. Since a remote time, people had abandoned it without order expressing their words. Since that time, the earthquake and the thunder had dispersed its sun-dried clay. The bricks of the casing had been split, and the earth of the interior had been scattered in heaps. The discovery of this inscription points out to us among the ruins still lifting up, lifting their heads, now, now this is A.T. Jones, the site of ancient Babylon, the still gigantic remains of a monument which, the days of Nebuchadnezzar uh, was believed to be the Tower of Babel. It is this that the inhabitants of the country still call, it's still called Burr's Nimrod, the Tower of, Be of Nimrod. And in the midst of the plains, it still looks like a mountain. 
our knowledge of the Assyrian tongue has revealed that the name Borsippa meant in that idiom the Tower of Tongues. Babylon is often designated in the Suniform texts by a symbolical name, ideographically written meaning the town of the root of languages, Borsippa by another meaning the town of the dispersion of tribes. These names seem almost like metal struck to commemorate the ancient tradition of the plains of Shinar. Another inscription found in that country plainly, ref plainly refers to the confusion of tongues. This is another inscription, okay, not written by Nebuchadnezzar. The, the writing is much mutilated, but lines enough are complete to make plain the object of the inscription, which was nothing else than to, t than to tell of an attempt at Babylon to build a stronghold or tower. The lines that are complete, or nearly so, are in exact accord with Genesis 11, 4 through 8, and read as follows. Babylon, corruptly to sin, went, and small and great mingled on the mound. Their work all day they founded, to their stronghold in the night, entirely an end he made. In his anger also, you can tell they're speak, whoever wrote this knew that God was responsible for scattering the people and, and bringing the work of, the, of building the Tower of Babel to an end. In his anger also, the secret counsel he poured out to scatter abroad, his face he set, he gave a command to make strange their speech. Violently they fronted against him, he saw them, and to the earth descended, when a stop he did he when a when a stop he did not make violently they wept for babylon very much they wept this reminds me of revelation 18 where the people you know, cry for the uh, uh, destruction of babylon the condition of this mound as seen in 1873 was as follows on the 17th of March, I started from Hilla to the mound of Burz Nimrod, which lies to the southwest. We had scarcely left Hilla when we saw this splendid pile, but a marsh now extended over a large part of the intervening country, and I had to travel several miles round its southern edge before I could reach the site. Burz Nimrod is one of the most imposing ruins in the country. It's standing in the midst of a vast plain with nothing to break the view, makes the height of the ruins more impressive. The principal mound rises about 150 feet above the plain. It is in the shape of a pyramid or cone, and at its top stands a solid mass of vitrified bricks. There is a splendid view of the country from the top, the surrounding towns and ruins being visible for many miles. Sir Henry Rawlinson, who examined this site, made out that it was a tower in seven stages, the lowest stage 272 feet each way and 26 feet in height. The second stage was 230 feet each way and 26 feet high. The third stage was 188 feet in length and breadth and 26 feet high, and the fourth stage was 100, 146 feet each way, but only 15 feet high. From receptacles in the corners of one of these stages, Sir Henry Rawlinson obtained inscribed cylinders stating that the building was the Temple of the Seven Planets which had been partially built by a former king of Babylon, and having fallen into decay, was restored and completed by Nebuchadnezzar. The Burz Nimrud, Nimrud is most probably the Tower of Babel of the book of Genesis. So most definitely Nimrod was involved in the building of the Tower of Babel, and he would have been the first king.
of Babylon. Now, Micah, let's turn to Micah 5 and verse 6. Micah 5 and verse 6. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus, thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. So Assyria and the land of Nimrod are synonymous. No coincidences. Now, Assyria and Syria are closely associated, almost synonymous. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible, Common, Bible Dictionary rather states, Syria is a loan word from Greek. It's an abbreviated form of Assyria. Another word which is associated with Syria is Aram, located in Genesis 10, verse 22. It states that the two sons of Shem were Asher and Aram. So Asher and Aram are of the same family. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible Dictionary states that when referring to this country, the word Aram is usually translated Syri Syria and Arami are Syrian. The Armenians, I, well, I guess as Arameans, were descended or descendants of Aram, Semites, probably originally from the area inside the great bend of the Euphrates. So the Syrians were originally from that area of the great bend of the Euphrates. And Asher and Aram, hopefully I'm pronouncing the word A or the name Aram or Aram uh, correctly, but those two men, they were both of the same family and they were sons of Shem. The Assyrians and self-exaltation. Let's turn now to 2 Kings uh, chapter 18. We may not, probably will not read the entire chapter. It's going to be a quite a lengthy it's quite a lengthy chapter, but uh, I just want to make one particular point there. Second Kings chapter 18. This is the account in the Bible where you have the king of Assyria exalting himself above God. So we'll start there. You can read the entire chapter um, on your own, but uh, I will start there at verse 19. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? See, all that, you, all that we're going to read here should remind us of the man of sin, the Pope, who exalts himself above God and above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Thou sayest, but they are but vain words, I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust on him. But if we say, but if ye say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and hath said the, to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee two thousand horses, if thou be able on your part, on thy part, to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain at the, of the least of my uh, master's servants, and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then said Eliakim the son of Hilkiah 
and Shebna, and Joah, and Rabshakeh, speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language. Notice, notice, he says, has, you know, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, okay, and uh, Shebna, and Joah, unto Rabshakeh. They said to Rabshakeh, speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the what language? The Syrian language, okay? In the Syrian language, where evidently the Assyrian spoke Syrian, for we understand it and talk not with us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall? that they may eat their own dung and drink, drink their own piss with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice to the, in the Jews' language, and spake, saying, Hear the word of the Lord, king, uh, uh, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand, neither let uh, Hezekiah uh, make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into, delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every uh, one of his, of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a, corn of, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that ye may live and not die, and hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord de will, will, will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his hand, his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? I'm going to stop right there, but this verse, this last verse, hath any of the gods of the nation delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? This sh should remind us of Revelation 13 and verse 4, speaking of the beast of, of Revelation, the first beast of Revelation 13, the papacy. Revelation 13 and verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Not the exact same words, but they mean the same things. Who is able to make war against the king of the north, the papacy? All right. So, okay, so along with that subject, we have Laban the Syrian, Jacob, Gilead, and the Euphrates. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 25 and verse 20. Genesis 25, notice 25, 20. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the daughter of, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. So note, this is the first mention of the word Syrian in the Bible. The 2520-year captivity for the ten northern tribes of Israel was under the Assyrian rule, and the Assyrians spoke Syrian. The two seven-year time periods in which Jacob served Laban. So you have that subject there in Genesis 29 and verses 1 through 35. I'm not going to go and read that for interest of time. You're from, you, you, most of you are familiar with this subject. If you've read about uh, Jacob, you've read about how Laban deceived him. But the fact is, the point I, I want to emphasize in there just is just simply that uh, Jacob served Laban two seven-year periods, or, in other words, two 2520-day periods. 
representing the 2520 year prophecy which William Miller discovered. So William Miller tells us in his Apology and Defense, from a farther study of the scriptures, I concluded that the seven times of Gentile supremacy must commence when the Jews cease to be an independent nation at the captivity of Manasseh, which the best chronologers assigned to B.C. 677. And of course, he goes into his discovery of the 2300 days, uh, ending in 457 uh, starting in 457 B.C. and ending in 1844, and 1335 days commencing uh, there at the taking away of the daily, and ending in 1843. The papal supremacy after... I'm sorry, back up. Okay, yeah. All right, so that's, that's the point I wanted to make on that. Uh, now... Here you have, and we're still talking about the continual. We're talking about uh, paganism pretty much started at the uh, Tower of Babel. I mean, we, I know we can go back to the Antediluvians, but at the Tower of Babel is when, is when it really got a, a start. And... Uh, Laban, what I'm saying here, in case I haven't made myself clear yet about this matter, Laban is representing the Syrians, or Assyria. He can also represent, you know, the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 and 8, uh, paganism, uh, and the papacy. You have the... the as far as the 2520 is concerned, you have the, uh, the, the Israel being in captivity to the Assyrians for 1260 years, and uh, under the Babylon, ba under Babylon for 1260 years. That's another subject. We can address that at a later time. So, one of the subjects here is Jacob and his family, they flee from Laban and his sons. So let's go to Genesis chapter 31. Genesis chapter 31. So again, a lot of this I'm not going to read. A lot of Genesis 31 I'm not going to read. I'm going to emphasize the fact that, as I'm sure you all know, uh, when Jacob... And his family left. They, they just decided, okay, the Lord told Jacob, I want, you, I want you to go back. I want you to return to your country, to your parents. And on his way, he crosses the river Euphrates. So when you, let's read uh, Genesis 31, verse 21. So he fled with all that he had, and he rose up and passed over the river and set his face toward the Mount Gilead. Okay, several points to make here. That word river, when you look it up in the concordance, in the concordance definition, in the strong concordance definition, it has several words in that definition, including the Nile, but also the Euphrates, okay? Uh, many times, and you can find this in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary or Dictionary, one of the two, that often whenever you spoke of the river in Bible times, they understood the Euphrates. Some of the time they understood the Euphrates. In addition to that, Sister White in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 193, tells us Laban's absence afforded opportunity for departure. The flocks and herds were speedily gathered and sent forward, and with his wives, children, and servants, Jacob crossed the Euphrates, urging his way toward Gilead on the borders of Canaan. Uh, I want a, a thought just occurred to me, and as a, something that in my study of the scriptures, okay, often, I say often, uh, sometimes. Sister White, in her writings, 
she will actually define words, not outright. She doesn't come right out and say, she, like in this one here, she didn't actually give us the definition of the word river in Genesis 31, 21. But the way that she, the manner in which she expresses this, this, this story, and she says that Jacob and his family crossed the Euphrates, she's giving the definition. And that's not the first time that she has done this. She does this other times in her writings. I have seen it before. And the reason why I'm making that point is because apparently some of the theologians in Adventism in their criticism of Sister White are downplaying the significance and the inspiration of the inspiration of Ellen White, the inspiration of the spirit of prophecy. They say, well, she wasn't a theologian. She didn't need to be a theologian. The Holy Spirit told her what these words meant, and she just put them in her writings. She, but she didn't go, like I'm going to you right now, and actually giving you the definition from the Concordance Dictionary. She didn't have to do that. She just put it in the narrative. So, the flocks and herds were speedily ga uh, gathered and sent forward, and with his wives, children, and servants, Jacob crossed the Euphrates, urging his way toward Gilead on the borders of Canaan. This is going to come up later in another study, because the Euphrates was on the borders of Canaan. We read about this some presentations ago there in Genesis chapter 15, where God gave Abraham the borders of the land he was going to give his people. And one of those borders was right there at the Euphrates. So urging his way toward Gilead on the borders of Canaan, after three days Laban learned of their flight and set forth in pursuit, overtaking the company on the seventh day of their journey. He was hot with anger and bent on forcing them to return, which he doubted he could, he, which he doubted not he could do, since his band was much the stronger. The fugitives were indeed in great peril. Patriarchs and Prophets, page one hundred ninety-three. Okay, so as you follow this story, you follow this narrative here in Genesis chapter thirty-one, and. Uh, you, it gets to a po point where Laban catches up with Jacob and his family, and he's very angry. He's saying, why did you leave like this? I didn't get have any, have any chance to say goodbye to my uh, daughters and my grandchildren. I could have had a party for you and all, a feast for you and all this celebration, you know. And um, you can read the whole, you can read the story. My point here is now going to be there starting in uh, verse, uh, verse, starting at verse 44. Laban says to Jacob, Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made an heap, and they did eat there upon the heap. And Laban called it Jegarsehadutha. But Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore was the name of it called Gal Galid, actually not Galid, but Galid, and Mizpah. For he said, The Lord watch between me and thee, when we are absent one from another. If thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar, which I have cast betwixt me and thee. This heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us, 
and Jacob swear by the fear of his father Isaac. All right. First, let's go back to uh, verse 21, where we are told that Jacob, with his family, uh, crossed the Euphrates River and set his face toward the Mount Gilead. All right. That word, Gilead, let's look it up in the Concordance Dictionary. And it tells us, among other things, that uh, the number for that is uh, 1568, okay? So, and it says in the definition that it is, that that is from 1567, okay? It's from another Hebrew word, and that number for that is 1567. So, when you, but so now when you look up the, the word or the name there in verse 47 and 48, Galed, G-A-L-E-E-D, okay, Galed uh, is actually the same uh, word as Gilead, the same name or, or word as Gilead, okay, and uh, it's, as you can see there, it's the same number, 1567, all right, and uh, then when you look up 1567, it means a, a heap of testimony, all right? And if you have a marginal reference in your Bible, hopefully you have such a Bible that has a marginal reference, it'll tell you the definition, the heap of witness, okay? Also, the heap of, uh, yeah, the heap of witness, the same it, it, that, that's what it means, a heap of witness, okay? So, in that 1567, the, 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 the number for Gale, or Galed, okay, you have, it's actually two words in the Hebrew, and one of those words, uh, uh, one of those numbers is 1530. One of those numbers for the word is 1530, and also 1557. Uh, 1557 is, simply means testimony, okay? That's, that's, that's all it means, testimony or witness, okay? But I want to uh, emphasize the 1530 part of it. So you look up the 1530, and uh, it tells you that it is a heap of stone or dung. By analogy, a spring of water, billows, heap, spring, wave, okay? And it tells you that it's from 1556. All right? So you look up 1556, it defines it as to roll, commit, remove, roll away, down, together, run down, seek occasion, trust, wallow. All right? So the, when you trace these, these words down, you come to 1556, and that's, that seems to be the end of the road. Well, when I was studying this matter a day or two ago, I had a thought. Could this word be related to the word or name Galilee? And the word, the name or the name Galilee is found in both the Old and the New Testaments. I want to emphasize the New Testament here because Jesus was in Galilee. All right. So let's go to look up the, the, the name Galilee. And it tells you it's a circle uh, in the north of Palestine. So, and it tells you the number there is, um, okay, now let me, let me back up. I, I skipped something. Right, let, let's go back in, back up to your notes uh, on page six. Uh, okay, the word, the name Galilee is number 1056. All right. So, it tells you that is the heathen circle. And it tells you in a definition, it is of Hebrew origin from H1551. So as you look up 1551, and it tells you it's the same as 1550, a circle. Okay? So you look up 1550, and guess what? It's from 1556. So go back up in your notes, and that word 1556 is the same word that uh, Galed and... and, uh, and uh, Gilead are related to. They're essentially the same word. All right. So we have come full circle. Oh, by the way, that, that 
1556. When it tells you it's 1556, it's a valve of a folding door as turning, also a ring as round. And why the difference there, I, I don't quite understand that, but the numbers are the same. And they even sound, the, the names even sound the same. So we have come full circle back to the word Galed or Gilead. Galilee is essentially the same word as Gilead and uh, and, and Galed. Notice now the next passage from Patriarchs and Prophets. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar which I have cast betwixt me and thee, this, this, this heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. For uh, the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us. And Jacob swear by the fear of his father Isaac to confirm the treaty, the parties held a feast. The night was spent in friendly communing, and at the dawn of day Laban and his company departed. Now notice, with this separation, now they had formed a covenant, and this covenant pretty much defined that they were going to be separated forever. <clears throat> so Sister White tells us this separation ceased all trace of connection between the children of Abraham and the dwellers in Mesopotamia. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 194. So the definition of Galilee, heap of testimony, or heap of witness. The, the definition of Galilee, a valve of a folding door, or ring, or circle. Notice also the name Mizpah in Genesis 31, 49. The marginal reference defines Mizpah as watchtower. So, in summarizing this, at least in part, after the two 25-20 year time prophecies were ended in 1844, there was a heap of testimony which separated the wise virgins from the foolish virgins and also validated William Miller's message. Jeremiah writes about waymarks and high heaps. In Jeremiah 31, 21. Let's turn to Jeremiah 31 and verse 21. Jeremiah 31, verse 21. <clears throat> Set thee up way marks, make the high heaps. And that word way mark is a monu monumental or guiding pillar. And heaps is an erection, uh, i.e. a pillar, probably for a guideboard. So it's very much like Gilead or G Galid or Galid. It's a heap of stones. So, set thee up way marks, make thee high heaps, set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest. Turn again, O virgin of Israel, turn again to these thy cities. And the cities there are a place guarded by waking are a watch. So there was a closed door, but there was also a an unfolding of light in regard to the prophecies of Daniel and John. A valve of a folding door is also a hinge or turning point. There was a turning point in 1844. A watchtower is also involved. So you have Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1, a verse that we should all as Seventh-day Adventists be very familiar with. Habakkuk 2 and verse 1, I will stand upon my watch. I will set me upon the tower. So you have a watchtower, that's Mizpah. I will, set up, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and, I, and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved or argued with. And that's exactly what happened there in, in 1844. Habakkuk 2 and verse 1 was fulfilled in regards to the uh, 1843 and 1843 chart. That was the answer that was to be given, rather the midnight cry, the answer, October 22nd, 1844. 
After the close, and this is from Jay and Loughborough's book, The Great Second Advent Movement, actually two quotes from page 482. After the close of the 2300 days in 1844, as Elder Joseph Bates went out to teach the third angel's message and the Sabbath truth, one of his favorite subjects, was tracing the Advent movement. He would start in with Jeremiah 31:21, set thee up waymarks, make thee high heaps, set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest. The way which thou wentest, what is that? I'm sure that Joseph Bates told the people the way that the Lord has led you in the past. This is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 39. Those who heard those talks urged him to print this discourse. It was in 1846. And also in 1853 and 1854, when laboring in company with Brother Bates, I often heard him speak on this favorite theme, which he denominated waymarks and high heaps. He would connect with his text the words of Paul in Hebrews 10, 32 through 39, thus showing that there was a similarity in the experience of the apostles and those giving the Advent message. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. And that's again from the Great Second Advent Movement by J. N. Loughborough, page 482. So in regards to the final separation between Jacob and Laban the Syrian, the final separation between God's people and the world, or the papacy, is represented. This happens immediately after the crossing of the Euphrates River. This can be seen from Genesis 31, 21 through verse 55. This is also connected with Genesis 15, verse 18. This, I mentioned, I alluded to this a little while ago, Genesis uh, 15 and verse 18, the boundaries of Canaan. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile River, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Here the Lord gives the boundaries of the land which he gave to Israel. Part of that boundary included the Euphrates River. I don't know yet all the significance of the Euphrates River in regards to uh, the end of the world. But I know enough to know, to understand, that the Euphrates River plays a vital role in Bible prophecy, as we have already seen with Revelation 16 and verses 12 through 14. But we intend to continue on the subject of the Euphrates in the next presentations, and we hope that all are understanding these things if you have any questions, please, I encourage all to place their com comments on the <clears throat> bottom of this video. Let us pray. Our great and holy Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us these lessons in thy word. We thank you, Lord, for revealing us great and wonderful things in thy word in regards to the subject of the Euphrates and uh, the subject of Babylon. And we pray, Father, that we would continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, O Lord, in these last days to prepare, especially by the studying the, of thy word, to prepare for the events that lie ahead, that we may be enabled to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus during the Sunday Law Crisis. We thank you, dear Father, for hearing our prayer and granting our request. In the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.